All right, time for a lecture two, Chem 223. <clears throat> so this class a lot of times can feel like a fire hose getting shot in your face. Uh, I don't know how it's going to feel to you guys at home. Obviously, your grade depends a lot on your reading and your ability to study independently, which is kind of the nature of online classes. But if you feel like you're having difficulty, please reach out to me. Okay, today we're going to talk about analytical balances and glassware. So on my slide here, I have some glassware from Beauty and the Beast. I have Mrs. Potts and Chip, her son, I guess. And of course, I have the balance over here. But what I'm hoping some of you didn't notice is that Lumiere here is not really a balance. He is a candlestick, and I added these balances myself, and I'm pretty proud of that. All right, we're going to start off with analytical balances, and we're going to learn how an analytical balance works. Okay, so every balance has some sort of stand that you put your sample on to weigh it, right? And most balances have some sort of lever. An analytical balance isn't any different. It also has a lever built in somewhere into it, and that lever rests on a fulcrum. And so if you put your sample here, it pushes this side of the lever down, pushes this side of the lever up. Okay, now we're gonna get into stuff that you've probably never really learned about before. This area right here is where all the magic of the analytical balance happens. And we're gonna start right here where the lever is stuck in between these two black lines. This region is actually called a null position sensor. So null is sort of a different word for zero. And so what this sensor is trying to do is measure whether or not the lever is in the zero position. If it goes up a little bit, then the null sensor says it's too high. If it goes a little, or if it goes below the null position, then the sensor says it's too low. So all this null position is doing is asking, is the lever in the right spot? If the answer is no, it's, it can't measure how high above or how far below uh, it is from the null position. It can just say whether it's in the null position or not. Then it takes that information and it sends it over to a servo amplifier. Now this amplifier right here measures how much off that uh, lever is from the null position, and then it sends or uses that information to affect a magnetic setup that we have over here. So you see on our lever right here, there's a little fork that's coming off. In reality, this fork isn't a fork at all. It's a bowl. So it's a little bowl or a cup that's sticking down here. It looks like a fork because you have to cut it in half to be able to see what's going on. But if we zoom in on this area right here, this cup is actually surrounded by a coil of wires. So those coil of wires right there are connected to this servo amplifier. And if you remember from physics, hopefully most of you have taken physics, but if you send an electric current through a circular loop of wires, you actually create a magnetic field running through the middle of that uh, loop of wires. So as you're sending this current through this loop of wires, and you're, the servo is constantly sending that current through, and then what you're creating is a magnetic field. And if you'll notice, this cup is resting inside of a permanent magnet. So this magnet that's shaded green here and has the south poles and north poles labeled is always magnetized. But then this coil of wires is what we call an electromagnet, meaning you have to run electricity through it to make it magnetize. And so the strength of your permanent magnet is constant, but the strength of your electromagnet varies with how much current you're sending through here. So as your sample is applying a force, causing this lever to go up out of the null position, your servo amplifier then sends a current through this wire coil to increase the magnetic field of the electromagnet. And that's going to interact with the permanent magnet and hopefully pull the lever back down. And so what you're trying to do is balance out the force being applied by your sample and the force applied by your electromagnet to get your lever back into the null position. 
You don't want it to go past the null position. You want it to rest right in the null position. Okay, so this servo figures out where the lever is from the null position sensor. Then it tells this electromagnet, send through more current or less. And again, this current is constant, so it's always running through there. But it's saying, do we increase the current or decrease the current to get back to the null position? And then all of that information is sent to some computer parts. Now you don't really have to know what these computer parts do per se, but you do have to know what they do. So let me restate that. You don't need to know how they do it, but you need to know what they do. I think I might have misstated that. But what these guys do is they take the electric current that it takes to get back to the null position, and they compare that to an internal calibration that is just in the system already. It's part of the manufacturing process. So it takes that electric current, compares it to the calibration curve, and figures out what mass is sitting on the balance. And then it gives it out as a readout for you to see. Right? So sample pushes down on the lever. The lever tries to come up out of the null position. So the servo amplifier pulls down on it by increasing the current in its electromagnet. And so that electromagnet, if it gets stronger, it can interact more with this magnet and pull itself down. And then the computer parts determine what's the current being used here, convert that into a mass. And then lastly, there's some other engineering components. There's an anchor over here to just make sure everything stays in line. And there is an internal calibration weight to keep this whole thing uh, constantly calibrated. All right. So in summary, how does an analytical balance work? Well, it tries to maintain a null position. It does that by trying to balance the force applied by the sample with the force of your electromagnetic field. We're trying to have those equal but in opposite directions so they cancel out. So when it so it then measures the electric current required to maintain the null position and then converts the electric current to a mass using its internal calibration. Now, why do we need an internal calibration weight though? This has already been calibrated in the factory. And they already know it works. Why do we need an extra calibration weight just to be there? Well, to put it simply, these balances were made at an elevation that's different than Provo, Utah, right? And so if you go up in elevation, you're decreasing the strength of gravity. You go down in uh, elevation, you're increasing the strength of the gravity. So the internal calibration weight uh, is a known weight that your system can always measure to adjust for changes in elevation and gravitational force. Additionally, even if you use this right in the warehouse that it's manufactured in, your permanent magnet is going to lose strength over time. And so by having that internal calibration weight in there that the computer already knows how much it weighs, it can figure out how to adjust its calibration curve over time, depending on how much magnetic field strength you've lost. So make sure you understand all of that. Let's have a practice really fast where I want you to just pause the video right now and draw an analytical balance for me. Okay, so pause the video and go ahead and do that. Now, I hope you actually pause the video because this is not only important information to learn, but it's also fun to learn, I think. So the balance picture should look something like this, right? I'm not going to go over all these details again because this is almost literally just a copy of the previous slide. Now, I will point out some things over here. All of this stuff over here, as long as you just know there's computer stuff, it's okay to just write computer stuff um, and just know what it's doing. You don't necessarily know, need to know how it's doing it. But you should understand the idea of the null position sensor and how the electromagnet interacts with the permanent magnet. And you should understand for sure the usefulness of the internal calibration weight. And you should understand this principle that we're trying to balance the force applied by the sample on the scale 
with the electromagnetic field strength to get our lever back into that normal position. Now, <clears throat> in analytical chemistry, we're all about having super high accuracy and precision. So I'm gonna introduce you to another topic now called buoyancy correction. So this has to do with measuring uh, things using a balance. And I'm going to start off by showing you a YouTube clip. These are some cute girls that are going to... These are some cute girls that are going to show you a cool experiment using heavy gases. Hi, I'm Rose. And I'm Anna. And we are going to be mad scientists. Everyone knows about helium. It's lighter than air. And if you put it in a balloon, it goes up. But some gases are heavier than air. So let me just pause and explain what's going on here. You see this tube running into the tank. They're flowing in a gas called sulfur hexafluoride, and she's just dropped an aluminum boat onto it. This is the same idea as a boat being dropped into the ocean. You just keep the curves up so that the cell for hexafluoride can't get over the edges and sink your ship. And now she's scooping out some of that as sulfur hexafluoride and saving the ship. Hi, I'm Rosie, and I'm Anna, and we have some new voices. I'm Rosie. You're crazy, man. I'm lucky, but you're crazy. Hey, Rosie. Hey, Rosie. Hey, Rosie. Hey, Rosie. Now those voices at the end were not fake. If you breathe in SF6, your voice gets really deep. I don't know if any of you ever saw a demonstration of that in 105 or 106. But what they were demonstrating was buoyancy. And anytime you're in a fluid, you're experiencing some buoyancy resulting from interactions with that fluid trying to displace you from where you're at. So I don't know if any of you have ever thrown something heavy into a pool and then gone to try and get it out. But if you throw a rock into a pool, it's easier to lift it up than it is in atmosphere. The reason for that is even though it's sinking, the water is still buoying it up to some extent. And when we're measuring things in air, we're also, or they're also being buoyed up slightly by the atmosphere around them. So if we're gonna get as accurate of a measurement as possible, we actually need to create or correct for the buoyancy of our samples in atmosphere. So the way we do that is with this equation right here. So we're trying to find the true mass, this m subscript true. And the way we do that is we measure a mass, this m measured right here, and then we multiply it by this ratio right here. So on top of this ratio, we have one minus the density of air, which, we'll, which I'll provide for you in the labs, divided by the density of weights. So in the, cal or in the analytical balances we use in this lab, or in this class, the density of our weights is always 8.0 grams per mil, and this is that internal calibration weight inside of our balance. And then on the bottom of this, we have one minus the density of air again, divided by the density of our object. So this is the density of our sample. So if we're trying to measure the, dens or measure the mass of water, this would be the density of water. If we're trying to measure the mass of a block of lead, this would be the density of lead. All right, so let's give this a try real fast. And we're gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you this question. If an analytical balance says a toothpick weighs 1.2000 grams, what is the true mass of the toothpick? And I have provided the density of the air, the density of the weights, and the density of your object down here. Now I will say with the density of the object, I assumed that the toothpick was made of American white oak, different trees, the wood of different trees has different densities, and I have no idea what wood toothpicks are made of. 
So I just assumed it was American white oak because that sounded the coolest. But go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can't calculate the true mass of the toothpick. All right, hope you didn't lie about that. Hope you actually paused it. So I'll be disappointed in you. So will your mom if you didn't actually pause it. Unless your mom doesn't care, which is possible. Okay, so all we're gonna do here is plug numbers in for these values. So our measured mass, of course, is this 1.200 grams that we read off of our analytical balance. The density of the air is 0 0.0010 grams per mil. That's gonna go up here and down here. The density of our weights, like I said, is 8.0 grams per mil. And then the density of our object, assuming our toothpick is American white oak, is 0 0.77 grams per mil. We just plug all that into our calculator and we get out 1.2014 grams. If you didn't get this number, check that you put the proper parentheses into your equation. As we go forward throughout this class, we're gonna get more and more complicated equations and parentheses soon become very important as do order of operations. Um, so make sure you got that all worked out and soon when you start learning how to do Excel, you're gonna to have to type in really long equations uh, and make sure that you can get those right as well. All right, so in class, when you're supposed to come to the lab, I generally give you a list of best practices. And I'll still give you those now, um, even though you're not necessarily going to apply them. But if you're ever gonna use an analytical balance, you should make sure that the balance is level to start with, because this will throw off the lever. It'll throw it off um, not in the access to the null position, but it can make it shift side to side, and that can actually mess up your measurement using your null position sensor. So most balances come with a circle leveler. So this is just like um, the level that a construction worker puts on the shelf to make sure it's level, except this one is a two-dimensional leveler. So it's got a little drop here, or a little bubble here, and if it's off balance, then it'll go off in one direction or the other. And then you have to just adjust it till it's balanced out again. Another thing that you should keep in mind is that you should always load all chemicals onto a sample tray outside of a balanced container. That'll just keep your balance a lot cleaner. It'll reduce the number of spills you have, etc. Some things you don't really have to worry about is keeping your balance area clean. So you should do that just to be a good citizen. And you're not gonna let me know if your balance area is dirty. If some of you come back in like a year and send me a picture of a dirty balance area, I, well, I'll probably think it's funny. All right, so that's it for balances for today. Now we're going to shift to volumetric glassware, okay? So what I have here are four types of generally used volumetric glassware. We have volumetric pipettes, graduated cylinder, a burette, and volumetric flasks. So we talked about a couple of these last time uh, and how to use them. And we're gonna get a little more detailed about how these all work. So first, these types of glassware can be sorted into three types of volumetric glassware, okay? The first, or the first type is to contain, the second type is to deliver, and the last type is not volumetric glassware. <laughs> All right, so graduated cylinders are actually not considered volumetric glassware. The reason for that, well at least one reason for that, is that their gradation lines aren't precise enough. So the gradation lines on most graduated cylinders are at most, uh, one mil apart, whereas if you're working with a burette, then those gradation lines are gonna be at most 0.1 mils apart. Additionally, graduated cylinders usually aren't made with as high of error tolerances or are, have higher error tolerances, so they have more uncertainty in them than other volumetric glassware. So they get thrown out. But let's talk about to contain and to deliver types of glassware. 
We'll start with two contain. So a volumetric flask is a two contain type of glassware. And that means it's made to contain, not deliver this 250 mils that's stamped on the side. So what that means is this flask, if you fill it to this line, will contain exactly 250 mils but if you pour this out into another beaker, you're still gonna have some solvent left or some, some solution left lining the glassware here. So you're not actually going to pour out all 250 mils of this glassware. So you ask, well, why is that useful then? Why is it useful to measure out 250 mils if you don't get 250 mils? Well, the reason it's useful is because glassware like this is designed to uh, be used to prepare samples with high degrees of certainty in their concentrations. So if you put uh, 10 mils of something in here and dilute it all the way up to the 250 mil line, you can be very certain that the total volume in there is 250 mils. And if you put that 10 mils in here, you're going to want to do that with glassware that is made to deliver. So to deliver glassware includes burettes and pipettes. And it, for these guys, they'll deliver the indicated volume. So what that means exactly is that they will get a volume out of the tip that is equal to the labeled amount. So for example, this 15 mil pipette, if you suck solution up until the line right here, then it actually has a little more solution in it than 15 mils. So when you dispense it, all that solution is gonna come out and you're gonna deliver 15 mils. Um, sorry, let me rephrase that. You're gonna deliver 15 mils, but not all of the solution is gonna come out. You're still gonna have some volume of liquid still in that pipette, but these pieces of glassware that are designed to deliver uh, are designed, are calibrated, knowing that there's gonna be some amount of liquid left over in the glassware. And so once the liquid gets past the tip of the burette, so as soon as it's past the end of the hole, I guess you could say, then that's considered delivered. So anything that makes it past that point has been delivered to your next sample container. Hopefully that all made sense. Again, these guys that are made to deliver hold slightly more than their labeled amount, but when you deliver that 15 mils, it's still holding a slight amount. So what you get out is actually 15 mils. All right, when you're reading a burette, though, of course, you have to deal with menisci. Menisci is the plural of meniscus. And so a meniscus, of course, looks like this. It's a curvature in the liquid caused by the liquid interacting with the sides of your glass. So especially if you use water, that really likes to stick to the silicon oxide on the side of your glass. It gets lots of hydrogen bonding going on there. So if you're reading this burette, what is the actual volume? Do you measure the meniscus from up here, from down here? Well, by rule, we always measure the menisci from the bottom. The bottom of the menisci is where you look. Now another point is that when you're using a burette, you'll actually always measure or always read the volume to one-tenth of a gradation line. So what that means is right here we've got 21 mils, up here is 22 mils, right in the middle is 21.5, and 21.6, 21.7. So what do we say the volume of this guy is it looks like it's slightly past that 21.7 gradation line. So it's getting in to the 21.6 area, but it's not very far past it. If it is past it, it's only slightly past it. So what we'd say is this has 21.69 or 21.68, whichever you think is more correct, is the volume of this solution in the burette. So generally when we measure with burettes, and generally when we measure with most things, that last digit is a guess. And we'll get more into that when we get into significant figures, I believe next week. All right, so now I said that this could be 21.68 or 21.69, whichever you prefer, or whichever one you think is right. And that gets us into uh, 
one of the last points we'll cover in this lecture. And that is calibrating glassware. So all glassware that you use has to be calibrated. Not just calibrated uh, by one scientist, but it needs to be calibrated by every scientist that uses it. The reason for that is all glassware and really all measurements have some uncertainty associated with them. Some of that is caused by you and your personal biases and how you make the measurement, and some is caused by uncertainty in the glassware or the balance or whatever you're using. So to give you an idea of this, I, I took a clear plastic ruler like this with its straight gradation lines, these really finely printed lines, and I put it under a microscope and took a picture of one of these gradation lines. So this blue line here indicates the length of this whole image is about 0.3 millimeters. So it's a pretty small image. But if you look at this gradation line, you'll notice it's not perfectly straight. There's plenty of bumps in it. And actually, if you zoom in really close on the surface of glass, most of the time you'll pretty quickly find little divots and bumps in your glass like this. And so all glassware has some uncertainty resulting from the manufacturing process that gives it slightly different shapes. All right, so there is some uncertainty caused there by the curvature of your lines and your gradation, curvature in your glass, etc. But then the next question is, if this thing isn't perfectly thin, where do we actually measure from? Do we measure from over here? Or do we measure from over here, somewhere in the middle? Well, this gets a little into your personal bias as to how you measure. So it turns out most people will uh, naturally um, pick one spot or another to calibrate to. And what I mean by that is, let's say we have two students here, student yellow and student pink. Well, the yellow student will generally always measure pretty close to the same spot, and the pink student will always measure pretty close to the same spot. And even though there's some uncertainty associated with where they'll measure it exactly every time, you know, the yellow student might measure from here once or from here once, generally the yellow student will always measure from a fairly close spot, and the pink student will always measure from a fairly close spot. And there's often a significant difference in those spots for the different people. So people are usually self-consistent. They'll generally be pretty close to what they did last time, even if they are relatively far away from what somebody else is doing, okay? So just to re-summarize that, all glassware has some uncertainty. Some of it's caused by you, some of it's caused by the glassware. And so we're calibrating for any natural uncertainty in our glassware and for any personal biases we might have uh, while we're making the measurements. Okay, so let me give you some practice questions. We'll see how you do with them. If you calibrate a volumetric pipette, can you use the same calibration value for a second volumetric pipette? Yes or no, and why? Well, the answer is a resounding no. So you can't use the same calibration value for two different pipettes. The reason is the two pipettes have different uncertainties. The curvature on their glass surfaces is gonna be different. They're just different pieces of glassware. And while we try and make them identical, no two pieces of glassware are ever going to be perfectly identical. Just like no two snowflakes will ever be perfectly identical. Anyways, if your lab mate uses your pipette, can she use your calibration value for that pipette? And the answer again is no. You and your lab mate have different biases. You're going to measure slightly differently. And so everyone needs to measure or to calibrate each piece of glassware they use personally. Okay. So that is all that I have for balances and glassware. So to finish this off, I actually threw some other stuff in the microscope. All right, up here on the top left, this is a picture of my fingernail. I, if you look, it's all kind of like scaly or something. I don't know. It looks like if you just scratched at your fingernail, it would all come off. Over here is a hair follicle that I pulled from my hand. I don't remember doing it, but 
thinking about it, I imagine it had to hurt. So this is the root that goes into your skin. Looks kind of like a pig snout, which is kind of fun. Down here is the stem of a plant that I ripped off before walking into the lab. And you can see all the little uh, holes in it where it can flow liquids and such through to nourish the plant, which is pretty fun. And over here is the bottom of a leaf. So this is from a different plant than this one, though I don't remember which types of plant either of them are from. You can see these little mouth things here where they kind of look like eyes. Those are the stomata that the leaf opens to inhale with. So that's where it breathes through. It was pretty fun. And then here's three more pictures. Here's just a piece of white printer paper I threw on there. This is at 200 times magnification. And here's a piece of lint that I pulled out of my pocket. I think the lint actually looks pretty cool. Just like a bunch of strings everywhere. This is at 100 times magnification. I feel like maybe I should have more pictures of balances or glassware at the end of this, not microscope slides. But, yeah. Whatever, what you gonna do? And here is the picture, there's a picture of a smiley face I tried to draw in some carbon tape. So carbon tape is just this black tape that you use to tape down like paper and lint and so forth to your sample slide or your sample stand before you put it in there. And I'm not super proud of this. Can't even see the one eye on it. Anyways, that is our second lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and let me know.